This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com and Welcome to yet another Boston WordPress meetup. How many people are new this session? Cool, awesome. Um, how many people found out about this through meetup.com? Uh, how about Twitter? <laughs> Um, all right, I am James Coletti. I'm one of the organizers. And uh, John Bishop. He's our newest addition to the team. Kurt Sachs. Yes. Um, so just a shout out to Microsoft Nerd, um, being an awesome sponsor, venue sponsor, um, since about April 15th, 2009. We've met consistently <coughs> since then, so thank you, Microsoft. One of our longtime sponsors, um, HostGator. If you want to put up a website, a WordPress site, and host it, choose HostGator, and use, you can use the coupon code below to save uh, for a 25% discount. So tonight's event is sponsored by 10Up, imagining, creating, and growing amazing web experiences with WordPress. Um, these guys do some awesome work, and uh, they are hiring, so check out bossandwp.org. There's a job post there. Check out their website, 10up.com. And um, there's Jake Goldman, one of the presenters tonight from 10up. Definitely catch up with him. Great. So uh, our meetup group is the third largest uh, WordPress meetup group in the world. About 1,200 12, yeah, 12, members and growing. Um, so tell your friends, anybody does anything to do with WordPress, whether it's developer, developing or just using. Uh, we try to mix it up and have multiple tracks. How big is the second one? Uh, <laughs> the second one, actually, we can catch up to the second one. The, third, the first one is kind of in the 2000s. Oh, okay. So we can get there. All right. Can we move the first one? Um, so we're looking for uh, people to help out with the meetup, um, whether it's helping organizing, running them, finding people to speak. Um, so if anybody's interested, uh, come and grab one of us, uh, or email one of us, uh, emails right there. And uh, also check out the bostonwp.org website. Uh, we have a lot of the stuff that we do on meetup.com, but all the videos and uh, all the follow-up stuff's on bostonwordpress.org. You can also check out the job boards. It's a good place to find like, local developers and to, post, uh, to find local developers and find jobs as a developer. Uh, and we also have a, a message board up there that's down right now. We're going to try and have that up soon along with some other new features kind of making the site easier to use. Um, and then bostonwpdemo.com. I think it's not working. currently it's not working, but <laughs> I'm actually it. I'm gonna try and get, I'm trying to get it working during this session. So hopefully you guys can go in afterwards and uh, play around on there. All right? Um, so... Donations, um, obviously every, the food and stuff is, is donated by companies and um, sometimes us. So w the website and the stuff that we use to, to run this and training workshops and things, that's where the money comes from. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor a meetup, definitely let us know. Thank you to all the people that have <laughs> donated and you can donate with PayPal at the website. And without further ado, um, Jake Goldman's What Would Core Do, which is the developer talk, that will be here. And um, Annie Schmidt's Design UX Content Strategy and SEO, which is a beginner session, will be in the other room. So if you guys want to split, we'll kick off the session. Oh, we also, before you guys leave. Oh, yeah, my bad. We have a book. First one with the hand up gets it. It's uh, Bloggers for WordPress. Oh, it's a hand up? Oh, Sorry. <laughs> So this is called what would core do, or extending WordPress with classiness and consistency. So I think you guys already got the overview of me uh, from uh, from James, um, but uh, I own a company called Ten Up that has a job posting up. We've got. Eight employees as of the beginning of April. I'm looking to bring on board a few more. Um, if you're a WordPress developer or just a great PHP engineer that's getting started with WordPress or um, you're on the wrong track and you're more interested in marketing, let me know because um, we're hiring. Um, I've 
authored over a dozen WordPress plugins. Some of you may know me as well, at least one former student here. I sometimes adjunct uh, teach at BU at the uh, CDIA in their WordPress program. Um, I write for Smashing Magazine now and then, and I tweet most of the useless things at Jacob Gold on Twitter. So the, the starting point for this talk is talking about, if we're going to talk about what would core do, let's talk about what core is. So in my mind, core is kind of like, you know, pick your poison, but I think it's kind of like a, a simple baseline Honda Civic. Um, it might not be the flashiest always car in the world. It might not promise to have every single feature that a dream automobile has when you take it out of the box, but it's simple. It's accessible to all kinds of different people. Pretty much anybody is comfortable hopping in a Honda Civic and driving it. Um, and it's modable. They have all sorts of a huge aftermarket for parts and accessories and souping up your car if you want to make it sporty um, and adding all kinds of uh, modable functionality. So this to me <laughs> is a problem we're going to talk about. <laughs> so WordPress core with plugins. So um, it's a little bit of an older Honda Civic in that picture, but we've all seen that car that probably was great at one point and somebody had some idea of all these some idea of this, you know, probably start as a cool thing in their head, right? Like their souped up car, they'll be sporting, it'll be awesome. And somehow between this idea of it being awesome and what it took to actually get there, the thing actually turned out to be a mess, right? You know, or they have, you know, like this is why, the, you know, it goes faster, okay? It, it met your feature requirement, and if you're a developer, you know, you can tell the guy, yes, we have more HTML5, you know, thanks to this plugin. Um, but it's probably not really what this guy had in mind when he said, I want you to make my car faster and more sporty. <laughs> so, it's, and it's way too much fun to get like pictures of like cars and stuff on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I can do this all night. But, um, so this is, I mean, it gets even crazy. So I've, we've seen, we work with WordPress implementations that have, like I'm sure if you guys are developers, you've seen them, they have like 60 plugins installed. You, you don't even, wh where's like the menu on the left for like the ad and where did it go? You know, it's like you get in there like these pages and you have like, these long list of features and you start, you, it's bare, if, if you didn't tell me this was WordPress before I came in and started using this thing, I probably wouldn't even recognize, recognize what it was. So just have a little bit more fun. <laughs> so it's too much fun. <laughs> it's a platform, right? Yeah, right. Don't what you want on <laughs> Um, <laughs> all right, so we'll come back to more fun car pictures later, but this this is probably what, in my mind, we talk about souping up WordPress and doing cool things. This is probably what that guy had in mind when we talked about souping up the car, which is, this isn't what everybody wants. I don't think most people that want a Honda Civic or most people that want a WordPress website want something with every bell and whistle and feature on it, right? But there are people that want that souped up <coughs> car. There are people that want WordPress to do, you know, meet every vaguely useful SEO criteria, you know, in the book, that want their car to be super fast and have every feature. And if you want to do that, you should be able to, right? The Civic, you know, is a very moddable car, which can be done tastefully or poorly, depending on how much you want to spend. WordPress can be modded, and in many cases it's done poorly, but can be done elegantly. So, what's the point? It's not that, I mean, this is a talk about extensions and how to extend WordPress. It's not that our extensions don't work. It's not that we don't, there's lot, not tons of great plugins that aren't well coded. There's plenty of plugins that are not well developed, that aren't well coded, but there's plenty that are great, work phenomenally, well architected, probably brilliant engineers working on them. It's that these plugins stick out like sore thumbs. They don't seem to fit when we use WordPress. It doesn't seem to me, when, when you have a client or a user that looks at them inside WordPress, they look, <coughs> it looks at them inside WordPress, um, they look like they just don't quite belong. Um, I had pictures in here at some point, but if you've ever seen, someone got lost, but if you've ever seen like PageMash, it's a page ordering management plugin, and it's, it works great, but you look at this page and it has like blue and green alternating rows and icons for grabbing it, and like a name in the menu called PageMash, and it works well, but it just, you take a client there, it just doesn't seem to fit with the rest of WordPress. So, why do, why do I think consumers, what I mean by consumers is, you know, is, is publishers really, why do they love WordPress? Um, 
I think it's simple for writers to understand. It's consistent looking. Um, it's intuitive. It's pretty. I think a lot of these are the same thing, right? Like when you get into WordPress, you don't go into the pages <coughs> section and feel like it's totally unfamiliar if you've written a post. You don't go from setting screen to setting screen and have to adjust to a totally new way of looking at something. Part of ease is consistency and is user, is user interface. Um, and then maybe, you know, let's add to the list, it's also affordable, right? Which again, I think is, you know, the cost to build a basic website, WordPress site, the more expensive cost usually, which is really the cost of maintaining it, right? Updating it, keeping it fresh. Um, those are very low costs, which I think, again, is really the same thing as the first two, which is the reason it costs so little to maintain WordPress is because it's very intuitive. It's because it's very natural to people. They don't feel like they need to spend hours and hours racking their brains over how to update a page or how to update a post. And so the premise of this talk really is that many of our extensions are ruining this. Many of the plugins we write, many of the ways we build out or add new functionality to WordPress is taking away what makes it so great and what makes it so effective. That's all my animations got lost, but so, um, the question is then, so what would, what would Core do? Um, so here's, here's our philosophy at our company. Um, the first one is, can you tell where out of the box WordPress stops and our custom functionality begins? Um, and we believe that if you can, if you can have a user who's never really done much with WordPress, who's just been introduced to it for this site they want to manage, and they can tell where and they can tell not just being Nas about WordPress where the product we started with ends and where this functionality we added on begins, then we probably did something wrong. We broke that experience of things being consistent and familiar. And then the second part of that question is, if the core team was tasked with building this functionality, how would they have approached that? So we, we, don't, we hold ourselves to a high standard. We have core developers on our team, people that write code you know, for the core WordPress project. And I don't think our clients, if we want to do, you know, if we want a project to be well done, if we want to really treat them right, we don't think that we should have some sloppy standard that's any less or any less capable than people that make the core project. So if we're going to add a functionality for dragging and dropping pages, or we're going to add a functionality for some SEO capabilities, our standard is if we were tasked with building this into the core product, how would it look? How would it feel? How would they engage with it? But what I want to do is encourage other developers to adopt that philosophy. WWCD, what would Core do when you're building extensions? So a mostly good example of this, I think, is Akismet, right? It's a plugin that ships with WordPress. That people turn on, it's the spam management plugin that comes right with that. I can actually pick on some of the more buried interfaces in Akismet, but when it comes down to the comments interface, right, when you're managing comments and managing your spam, I don't know about you, this, but when I use Akismet, I never stop and think I'm using a plugin. I almost forget when I'm using it that this, that this just wasn't even built into WordPress from the beginning. The, you know, the place where the spam comment is, the places where you choose whether it's spam, the place you go to empty out your spam or preview your spam, it all feels natural. It feels like it should have been there from the beginning in the comment system. It doesn't feel like a bolt-on or some tacked-on functionality. So. Here's the wrong way of doing it. So has anybody ever used a plugin called CForms2? I have. All right, don't, don't be so embarrassed. It's all right. <laughs> um, it makes a great example. Um, so this is a plugin called CForms2. It's one of the older, earlier in WordPress, build your own contact form kind of plugins. And again, you know, remember, I'm not saying that it's poorly programmed. The thing works pretty effectively. You know, gets the job done. You know, the most of the calls work. It could be better, but it's not badly engineered. It just it doesn't look or feel anything like the rest of WordPress. So let's just start with something simple like colors. So we have this sort of gray, gradient, gray interface, mostly in WordPress that we've all come to you know, be very familiar with. And then we get these sort of wild colors like, this, like these deep blues and these, and these bright yellows on the interface. But the most basic level, why, where, did these, where did this color palette come from? So if you want to choose a form in C forms, if you want to navigate between the different forms to edit, there's this drop down where you navigate to and you select from a drop down box the form you want to edit. Right now where um losing all my little annotations, but where else in WordPress do we edit 
do we choose content we want to edit like that? <coughs> like I know we have a page view and a posts view where we have a list of things we want to choose to edit, right? And then we click edit and it brings it to the editor. But in C-Form's case, they broke that, in my opinion, they broke that convention that users are used to for selecting their content and shoved it up in a drop, a drop down box in the corner. They have these icon conventions throughout for different columns that don't look like icons elsewhere in WordPress. They don't feel like the icons that we use elsewhere. Um, you know, where do they come from? This is my favorite part of C forms. You know, I and mean, maybe we can forgive like the color, right? Like that. That was probably built before WordPress changed its color palette and moved to the left sidebar. But clearly, they've updated C forms at some point to talk to that nav bar, that menu bar at the top. I'm trying to understand what developers said we should put the save and update form settings button in the admin bar at the top of the page. I don't remember editing a post and having like a save post option in the menu bar, you know, or having like just go to C forms admin you know, or edit all posts spaced out in the admin bar. But they decided to throw it up there for some reason in the admin bar. They probably thought like from a standalone, forgetting how WordPress does things, you scroll down the page, anywhere you're on this page, you can click save, but it's just Again, if you're a if you're a if you're a Joe user and you're not technically savvy, you're trying to edit this thing. It just totally breaks the conventions, you know. So now we have this. So why is forms at the bottom, right? We have the new C forms menus below everything, below all of our settings. Normally, content goes up here, right? The kinds of content we want to edit goes in this space. <coughs> Instead of calling it just something like maybe forms, like we have posts, pages, they called it C forms too, right? There's a help menu. You know, so it's a help, I know it's kind of in the corner, there's a help sub menu beneath the C forms menu. Now, everywhere else we have that help menu, and, you know, granted, not everybody knows it, but there's a little help menu in the top right, that little pull down that we have. They decide that we should put help underneath that sub menu. You can imagine in WordPress if in every single one of these menus there's a help, you know, button. So, in my opinion, not a lot of thought. Not a lot of thought put into the plugin. So, we built a plugin that I, I built a plugin called Simple Local Avatars, uh, which I want to use as a case study to talk about why I built this plugin and how I approached how I built it. So, why did we build it? Um, as the bullet says, I just wanted a freaking upload an avatar feature, and I wanted it to be I wanted it to work as nicely as Gravatar. So, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, WordPress by default, hopefully most of you know as developers, has Avatar functionality, but you enable it by basically going to this Gravatar service by automatic and uploading an avatar, and then WordPress references it. That's fine in most cases, but working on business sites, sometimes people wanted to have their authors have a photo that's not the user's photo on Gravatar, which might be goofy or they don't have control over it. They want to override that. So you can imagine those use cases where you want a local avatar. So all I wanted to do is be able to replace that avatar that Gravatar provides with their own little local copy. That's it. Very simple, very easy, I think. So, weren't there plugins I did this before I reinvent the wheel? I asked that question myself before I was going to build it and said, surely somebody must have a simple replace avatar with local avatars. Um, so, I found one and found, or I found a few and found, as we'll look at, that I get a full page of settings, um, including author credits. I get a completely new admin screens just to manage the avatars. Um, it adds a whole, it's a whole layer of other functionality beneath it for using your Facebook avatars, using your Twitter avatars for users, integrating Snapshot for like your website picture if you want. This whole, all of this functionality, which I think individually might be good plugins. I think there might be a neat plugin called Facebook avatars that could replace your avatar. There might be a neat plugin called Twitter avatars. But I don't see why all of this bloat needs to be built into this plugin. So this is the plugin that I looked at before I decided to build my own. It's called it's called Add Local Avatars. Um, so for starters, we have a entirely we have an entirely new user list, an entirely new screen, just for managing avatars. So in my mind, I just wanted to pick when I'm editing the user their avatar. So I just, and this isn't this isn't like the users list screen. This is a new screen it adds in the menu just for. Managing local avatars. Mostly redundant, where I can tell the username again, the nickname again, the email again, and then it gets into your Twitter ID now, and then <coughs> your Facebook ID, and all these other columns. So, do I really need a whole new management page just to edit individual users' avatars? 
So then you go into the settings discussion screen. You have this whole, this isn't even everything, you have this whole set of new fields to deal with. Um, you know, I, I just look at this and I say, I, I just want to upload local apps. Why do I need to configure all this? So it asks me what path I want to save it in. Um, I don't know why we really care, as long as we use the settings in WordPress media for where we want to save our media. There's a resize upload parameter, which last I checked with Gravatar, with the get avatar function of WordPress, you can tell it what size you want when you embed the avatar. So there's an avatars in posts. So this is classic. This is like classic, doesn't belong in this plugin, right? So the, one of the things this plugin does is it gives you the ability to embed inside your post content the user's avatar, which I'm sure is a great feature. Some some users that aren't you know, developers want to get their avatars inside their posts, but to me, this is a different plugin. They should have released a plugin called Add Avatar to Posts separately. They might work, might play nice with their other plugin. But if I just want to add a local avatar, I don't need bloat for features like adding, you know, make it a separate plugin, compartmentalize it. And then, of course, the infamous, the infamous, <clears throat> you please give me a credit <laughs> everywhere field, which, you know, I appreciate the idea. I don't think many people choose yes. I don't think, you know, I don't think, you can't imagine WordPress core deciding like the next step of WordPress that every core contributor should have a give me a credit option on every page that they added to. Right, like I, I get that you want a credit, you, you know, there is a plugins page with your name of your authors and a link to your site. You know, if they want to find who made this plugin, they want to help out, they can do that. Let's not, like every single plugin we add, let's not later on more and more give me a credit option. So I said, all right, forget this. I'm not doing it. It's time to make a better solution. So I decided to make simple local avatar. So how many new admin menu screens is my plugin at? No, no new admin screens. How many settings fields, how many new fields to configure does the plugin add? It adds one to the discussions page. Um, because I saw this as a potential security issue, which lets you say that, lets you decide whether users that don't have media upload permissions, or just everybody below author, whether they're allowed to upload an avatar. So if you choose yes, it overrides WordPress's default security and says any user that has access to the user screen can upload an avatar, or if you leave it off, only people that have media upload permissions for security can upload those avatars. And then how many fields does it add to the user profile screen? It adds one. Upload your avatar. I guess there's two, which we'll look at if you count the little checkbox that says, delete my avatar. Um, so this is the new, these are, this is the new big settings screen, or the new big settings field for the avatar. There's one field, just a little checkbox, which you can ignore, and most users will never even notice it's there, but if somebody asks me, I want my contributors, or my, my, uh, my subscribers to upload an avatar, I can tell them go to the settings page and give them permission. And then what does it add to the user screen, the actual user profile screen? It adds one field, upload my avatar. That's pretty much it. It's pretty much what this plugin does and adds. It just, it just works. Um, so I picked a little bit on plugins. I picked a little bit on one for plugin suspects, but it's, this is not just about plugins by any sense of the imagination. In fact, themes, really, are probably some of the worst offenders out there when you build themes in terms of adding bloat and excessive configuration to WordPress. All right, so this is a theme that, uh, again, not badly programmed, just not well thought out from a UX standpoint. This plugin's called Weaver, available in the repository. And this is the Weaver option screen. So again, in terms of, you know, what would core do? So they have these like weird, they have these tab styles with this blue italic bold highlight for the tab that doesn't exist anywhere else that I've seen. Um, it has two layers, right? Two layers of tabs here. Uh, of course, they need, to put, they need to put their donate button that doesn't fit anywhere on this screen, in addition to on the theme screen where there's plenty of links to go back to your theme. There's like, we, they've invented like weird new layers of heading header depth because they have so many layers to their settings. Uh, they have they have this weird font that they're using for the word CSS. Um, I'm not really sure why they chose it. Um, we have color settings fields elsewhere in WordPress. You can pick a color, like on the header screen that has like a little. You click it, it gives you the little you know color dial 
or you can pick a color. They've instead decided that there'll just be a text box here where you can type in a hex value you know, of your plugin. So not so much with the feeling like core. So um, so best practices thinking about design. Um, so the question that I'm asking is, or that I'm suggesting is when you think about how a page like that should be laid out, like a setting screen, right? The question isn't just what would core do. This one's actually an easier question. It's not a hypothetical one. It's what does core do, right? So you can open up the uh, Firebug or Chrome Inspector, whatever it is, look at your settings pages, look at all the different you know, the way that they structure their fields. Copy it. Look at where they have classes for different kind of things. There's all sorts of classes built in, like regular text and code for input fields to give them a certain kind of style and certain kind of look. See how WordPress does it when you're adding your own settings fields. See the conventions they use just by looking at this, by looking at their code. Think about, think about your settings screen. So when you create new, when you, when you need to add new settings, and I would challenge you to think about whether you actually even need to add new settings, but when you choose to, think about, think about what you need to add. Do you really need to add new top-level menus to WordPress? This is a user role management plugin that not only adds new fields below the user <laughs> menu, but also adds two new top-level fields below that for restrictions and roles. So I think these probably could have just been tucked under Touch under user management. Um, does it even need to have its own page? Or can you add it to an existing page, like writing settings? Should it be a drop down? Or should it be a drop down or a radio button? So when you're adding fields, look at what WordPress does, right? If there's two choices, you need to make sure you make it a drop down, or can it be radio buttons? Right? Maybe once you get beyond three, four choices, it makes sense to do a drop down, but it doesn't know if it makes sense. Do you even need any settings, right? So WordPress core sort of has this, this sort of a, a half joke, I guess you'd call it, among the core team that actually says, if WordPress ever adds a new settings field, if we ever add a new settings option in WordPress, two more need to come out. Right? And the point is that we value, which I think we talk about in a, more in a later slide, but we value choices. Right? You don't need to give your user every choice in the world. Right? Then you get like the open office like settings screen, right? <clears throat> Where you have like 700 options, right? What makes what gives WordPress character is that it's not one of these CMSs where you have 700 configuration options. It just works, and there's a plug-in, and there's great methods to extend it. As a developer, what it does out of the box, or what the decisions that it makes, don't fit you. So best practices: um, leave dashboard alone. So. Another great plugin, W3 Total Cache, one of the things that he insists on doing by default is adding his news feed to your dashboard. Right? So the general idea here is stop, the general concept here is stop advertising to us, whether it's adding your widget when you install your plugin to the screen to fill it up with your own personal news, whether it's adding donate buttons everywhere and giving you credit buttons everywhere. Just avoid the temptation. People want to find you, people want to appreciate what you're doing, they're going to in the plugin screen. All you're going to do is make them more likely to uninstall and not want to use your plugin if you're cluttering them up with ads and junk. So less is more. Um, this is what I was just talking about, right? So this is, this is again, that role scoper plugin. This is its settings page, or one of its many settings pages, right? We're not even, this long list of settings isn't even the advanced screen, right? There's another tab up there called Advanced. Um, so again, the paradox of choice, what we just talked about, save it for another plugin, save all these options. Decisions are greater than options, right? Make a choice for your users. Think if only 3% of users or 4% of users want this choice, unless it's really important for like security you know, or a really critical feature to your plugin, consider just leaving it out and giving the users ability to extend. So some techniques. Um, settings API. So WordPress, the, it's who here, I know the developer talking, has anybody here not, or let's ask it the affirmative way, who here has used the settings API to add fields? And, is 
settings. All right, so for those who have it, it has. <clears throat> WordPress has a settings API, which makes it, it could be better, but it makes it, it gives you a way to add fields, new settings fields to existing screens in the admin. So if you want to add to the writing page or you want to add to the discussion page, one new choice, don't add a whole new settings screen. Look at the add settings fields, or you can add a, you can add a section on the discussion page or a new section to the media page. Right? Consider if you only have two or three fields rather than adding new menus to their screen, just extending those existing settings screen where it makes sense to add new choices. Just like in the local avatars plugin, there was a new, uh, there was a new settings field on the discussion page. <coughs> so the screen API. So one of the things, there's, there's another way to do this before WordPress 3.3. WordPress 3.3 uh, introduced a screen API which gives us a lot more control over in the admin of what we can do on individual, what they call screens or settings pages or any page really in admin. Um, one of the things that that plugin does is give us a lot more control and the ability to do a lot more with, the, with the, that little help pull down tab. So using the screen API, and this is a, this is a snippet of code, um, which you can find at the link above, you can add new, you can add new help that built-in dropdown. So, I know a lot of people don't notice that help dropdown, but it is there. You don't need to add your whole own documentation at the bottom of your settings page. You don't need to add another page like CForms does, you know, for help. You can add you can add these little like sub tabs under that help dropdown. You can add more information, more help, links to your site if you want to send them. You know, that's probably an appropriate place to do it if you want to send them to get more information. Add the instructions where WordPress adds its instructions. Add hooks to your extensions, right? So again, this is what you know. What does Core do? So, you know, WordPress doesn't say we're going to build this piece of software and it's going to do everything anybody would ever want CMS to do. That's called Joomla. Um, instead, it says we're going to build something that does 100% of what 80% of people want to do, right? And if people want to do more and if people want to take it further, we build in these hooks and extensions and these fr this framework for doing more. With WordPress, apply that th apply that concept to your plugin. Add hooks inside your plugin so other developers working on a theme or working on a plugin that modifies yours or building something for their client can modify some of the behavior of your plugin and extend it further. So if you don't, you know, if you don't know, if you've used maybe if you've hooked into hooks before but you've never actually added a hook, it's not that it's really not that tricky. For, you know, you do that add action when you want to add an action hook. So if you want to, all you have to do to make a hook of your own and you add a hook of your own into your plugin or your theme is a do underscore action, the name of it. People can hook into the name of it and run that action at that whenever they want. If you want to filter something that your plugin does, you know, if you want to be able to be able to modify some output that your plugin does, you can apply filter. Um, and then the, uh, whatever you want to call it, that's what people will hook, the name of the thing that people will hook, and then whatever it is that they're modifying. So add hooks into your own extension. Finally, clean up after yourself, right? So, yeah, so those of you that you know, get it, the idea here is, right, that the party's over, but there's still a mess to clean up, right? So how many of you have, you know, I'm sure probably most people in this room have installed some terrible plugins and said, oh my god, this thing's breaking everything. All I should have, and let me just uninstall it, I'll go about my happy life, and you uninstall it, and things are still broken, right? Because plugins can do pretty much anything that they want within WordPress with within WordPress once you install them. Right? They can delete files if they wanted to in WordPress. They can add tables, they can delete tables. They have pretty much free reign you know, within WordPress. So oftentimes they'll add new tables, they'll add new options. Use the uninstall hook, document that, that link, so when your plugin or your theme uninstalls itself, clean up. Delete options that you've added to the options table. Right? Remove any custom tables that you've added. Take out modifications that you've made to WordPress. Clean up after yourself. That's it. <laughs> yes. Questions? Well, on the last slide, you mean uninstall hook or uninstall script? So the um, I mean uninstall hook. This link is right. So WordPress had there's a special hook yeah. for plugins. It doesn't work for themes, just for plugins. That when you that allow basically. The simple version is when you uninstall that plugin, this hook fires. So WordPress will run this sort of last hook, special kind of hook you set up. So that when 
when they do the uninstall routine, WordPress basically says, go ahead and run that. If they have an uninstalled hook into WordPress, run that before you do it. they wanted you to use uninstall PHP. Yeah, uninstall PHP basically is a, yeah, that's one way you can do it. it, it that fires through that hook. It just WordPress abstracts it. My, my real question is, um, one of the most terrifying things about installing uh, plugins is uh, security and the fear that the plugin is going to give away the score or something like that. So do you have recommendations? So in the spirit of what would Core do and how can we make users comfortable, do you have advice on how to convince users that uh, the, the <coughs> The users being like somebody just downloading a plugin yeah. from the repository? Um, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think that, so how do users make that decision? I mean, users, if you talk about general, you know, you the had, average. You had, a, you had a nice example in your talk where you basically made it clear to the user or to the administrator that um, I'm going to give you control over who gets to upload the avatar mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Is there, is there a collection of things that you can do like that? Um, there's not a collection of those things. I mean, I think it's a tricky question to answer because when you say users, you know, what springs to my mind is different users have different expectations. Users don't really, the average user is not a developer, right? They don't know, you know, they're, they're, if they're, if they're sort of ignorantly blissful, they just install a plugin, they just assume if it works, it works, and it's self-evident. You know, if they're smarter, maybe they're paranoid, and there's no, there's no, like, if you try putting in your readme file something like we've audited for security, or we take into consideration the following you know, security issues, like in my case, media uploads. Um, but I don't, I don't know uh, something specific you can say that make users feel like they're plugging secure. I think the best thing to do is, you know, is to, uh, you know, if you have it like, on the repository, show that you care by having good screenshots of your plugin, having good documentation about what your plugin does. I mean, at the end of the day, hopefully people that are smarter will, or not smart will try your plugin, leave it good ratings. Um, you know, people, it's interesting to me because people always talk about this issue. And to me, like, I, I don't see this really except for the fact that it's on the web as being any different than like when people like install like a piece of open, uh, of open source software like on their desktop, right, or a piece of free software, like on their desktop computer. I mean, you, you don't know. Unless you're going to open up the code and look it up your line, we don't know most of the time, whether or not it's secure or not. Um, well, except that most software systems have some safeguards for, for, that, for that. Right, like you can't like delete system files. Right, so I, I'll ask it a different way. Is core team doing anything about some kind of sandboxing or some kind of access controls or something so that um, if a plugin needs to do something that is somewhat sensitive that you get alerted that this plugin is you know, uh, like on your iPhone or on your Android device, if an app is going to do something and needs permission, it kind of has to ask for permission to do so. Maybe an awesome plugin. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Everything in the core function, in the core of work. Just make sure it looks consistent. <laughs> So I think it's a great question. I don't know, maybe somebody else in the room knows. I don't know of any specific efforts being made to do like sandboxing, at least in the at least in the sense of like protecting core files. Um, I know that there's always been like discussions, not so much about being in core, but being on like the plugin repository that does like an automated audit of the plugin to make sure there's nothing suspicious. I can tell you that if I mean, so two thoughts going through my mind right now. The first is if I would tell any client that's super concerned about anything that might go on, on their site. There's no, there's no security plan like backing up, right? You know, so you can roll back to a point where you know it's safe, right? The second thing is you can, if you want to be overzealous and over concerned about security, it's going to make it harder for you to manage WordPress and update WordPress and maintain WordPress, but you can lock it down much more aggressively. You can change the permissions of like core files or things not in the WP content holder, or even things throughout the WordPress installation. In fact, I was just talking to somebody about who wanted to get around that problem, right? You can lock down work file permissions so that like plugins can't change any files. They can't add a file, they can't delete files, they can't edit PHP files. You can lock down the permission schema, you can lock things down so <laughs> plugins are pretty locked out of doing anything malicious. Just, it's gonna make it more of a pain for you when you go to like update WordPress, or for plugins that want to do genuinely harmless things. Or like if you lock down the entire file system, you know, for local avatars plugin, you might not be able to have it automatically resize and create new image sizes. 
Um, you could just lock thing, everything down to the WE content folder. It makes it harder, again, for you to up, update WordPress. But you could switch it to that mode, like when you need like FTP, and username and password to do automated updates. So files don't have permissions. So, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting question. I'm kind of giving a, a seat of my pants answer. I think the, I mean, the fundamental challenge here is really probably one of the way Apache and PHP and the way our permission structures work. Um, it's really more of a web security model issue than I think something particular to WordPress. Um, but I think I'm rambling now. Any uh, other questions? So, like you mentioned that the help, you know, you see contextual help up in the top right corner, um, but most people don't realize that's there. It's like right. a huge problem. So what's, I mean, to me that seems like that would be something that you would want to modify or at least change the color, make it bright red, do something so people actually know that's there. Because I'm getting emails all day, every day, because they don't know it's there. Like yeah, so the first thing that came, I think, although I'm not sure I would turn it bright red, but, um, but I do think it's I do think it's a good point, right? I mean, I, we bear, I barely notice it's there half the time. Right? I get it's there. I think that's intentional. They want it to be out of the way. You don't want help to be in the face of something that's used to the tool. So there's two, again, there's always two, right? There's two things that I'm thinking of. The first is that's a problem WordPress as a software, core software product needs to solve, not you as an individual developer. So hopefully if enough people are saying in the community, the way we get to help sucks, nobody finds it, that core WordPress will extend ways or make ways to help more obvious in ways that are compatible with like the, the API we just looked at, so it doesn't break. The other thing is that there are efforts to improve the help system in WordPress. So like 3.3, people may have noticed, introduced these like little call-out bubbles. Right. right. So they are we are working on ways to call more attention to things like help and key features. And there is an API for adding your own. So you could actually write a plugin, for example, that every, the first time you go to any page as a user, it puts up a little, it throws up one of those help bubbles and points to like the help. Okay. I can also just jump in there. What I've, what I've done before as well was to, if I know that my clients are going to have trouble with like that help button area, just as an example, is to code your plugin or your theme to use the help system as it is, and then add another plugin on top of that that modifies the way help is handled site wide. So then when it help is in upgrade is improved at some point in a later stage, your code and how that is a switch. Yeah. That's a good way to do it too. I mean I would encourage if it's really a big issue for you now, I would try to I would personally try to use the the help bubble. Um, right. use that API that's in there now to call more attention to it, which is kind of consistent with the way it works. Um, I mean I know I have the same problem, but to, to me it's easy enough to tell people, hey by the way, right. notice going forward that there's this help button. The truth is, even if they notice it's there, they're probably going to want to talk to you anyways because it's too much effort to read and find the answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they probably know it's there. Yeah. A quick question for you. So, I've got I've built a few plugins, and um, one of them I've had a lot of people requesting different features. It, it basically is a plugin that, using a short code, it will do a new WP query and generate a, a, a table of uh, posts, you know, like an index of posts that you can put anywhere on the site. Um, but as people are requesting more and more features, it's, the shortcode parameters are just getting out of hand. It's getting ridiculous. Um, how would uh, how would Core handle that? How would Core handle that? <laughs> <laughs> it probably would stop trying. <laughs> I think um, so. I mean, shortcode. I mean, I can go off on a tirade here, right? Like shortcodes to me is something overused in general. I have another talk on. Um, in fact, I think there was a slide in here once about that. I think there's like an older version of my deck because there's a couple things missing actually. Um, so forgive me. But um, the, uh, I actually have a talk about editing the editor, which actually talks a lot about short codes. And basically, the premise is um, short codes kind of suck as an option. Like they're cool for us as developers because they make it easy to add new functionality in the editor. They make it very easy for the API to add functionality. But from a user perspective, they they, they kind of suck, right? Like. You have to ask your users to remember these arbitrary names and use brackets and these arguments. They're not a good solution for most clients. Um, the, the partial answer that I give in that talk, other than just complaining, is to use the, um, is you can add new buttons, it's tiny MC, right? So if you're going to sort of get really complex with things you want to add inside your editor, if you, um, if you look up how to edit, like add MCE buttons or tiny MCE buttons, you can actually add you know, your own Everything from a simple button that just inserts a short code to like a whole pop-up screen, 
where you can have them configure all kind of options and click insert and inserts the short code. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the gallery plugin, right. you know, does by default. So if you really want to keep it easy and have those kind of options, don't force them to remember all kinds of crazy short code parameters. Um, it's, it's interesting. I'm also just wondering, like, what what are you actually inserting in posts with short codes? Also, uh, let's say it, it, it generates a sortable table. So the, you click on the column headings of the table and right. sort, yeah. and it's just an index of posts. Like, so let's say you wanted to have a list of all your posts in a certain category in a page or a post, like embedded. It allows you to do that, um, and I'm adding functionality in response to it. But basically, everybody's asking for. Uh, I'm basically recreating the whole WP query arguments, you know, like yeah, sure. up to a point right now where I just want to let people write their own custom parameters for, for WP query and, and just use those. Um, just trying to figure out the best way to approach it, so open any ideas. You just have a query string option and have them actually that's, pass that's their own. The <laughs> right, that's yeah, it's, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm leaning towards, just having a text box yeah. that, you know, like a, that they can just write their own uh, custom query parameters of, Rather than say like okay well I want I want it to be sorted by this and I want to only include posts that are in this it's category right. and this text and only, it, it just gets out of hand after a while. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually I think it's an interesting problem to solve. I think the uh, I guess I think the the simplest answer I can give without giving it more thought is start using the you know the editor. And even and I do agree that that's, that's a good idea to be able to create a binary of gravity forms does the same mm -hmm. thing. And, um, I think that's a great idea. It's just even that, you know, I know with gravity forms when you use that, it just plops the short code in there for you and still going to be this huge short yeah. code. Yeah, yeah, and there's if you want to get really hacky, you can work around that and kind of do things like the gallery plugin does and insert some spans inside, use the editor style sheet, look into there to get crazy with it. But um, yeah, I almost wonder if you know if there, if you want to have like almost like a separate some separate screen where you create like graphic forms, right? You create different query views. And, create the table and then when all you're embedding in the, the posts table, yeah. is the different views good idea. that they're creating. But I'll just off the top of my head. More generally, with feature, as, as people request features, I mean, it can, they can kind of accrete. So at some point, you switch and over to making a new plugin that works with your original plugin. Any general guidelines for how to manage that process before you decide that it's time to break into a new project? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, my, I mean, I'll say what my philosophy is. My philosophy is to adhere to the same idea that WordPress adheres to, which is I don't want to, I want to give 80% of users 100% of what they need, right? So if it's a feature that's only going to be used by sort of the maybe I don't know if 20% is the real number, but 15% or 10% or 20%, and it comes at the expense of degrading the experience in some way. Mm -hmm. For the other users, it shouldn't be in the plugin. Right? Now, again, you want to add your own hooks so people can modify it. You can put code on your sort of help page or here, put this in your functions file for your theme. If you want to add this functionality or you know, make a make a child plug, what's the problem with child plugging? We all know there's no way to like do a there's no current real way to say like this is the required parent plugin, which hopefully will fix at some point. Yeah, um, I was just thinking like with the avatar one, if you get you know you you, you get your thirty somethings and your twenty somethings in the same building, your twenty somethings are like I already have avatars all over the place, you know. So I want to be able to select it from uh, from from Facebook or whatever, and then you, you're back to the original one. Right, just how you get the key key. So so, um, but in that case, you'd say. Something like add that's really not the bulk of users. Let's start. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say I get I get asked those things. I have people ask me all the time. Can you add the like the inserting the like post company? Can you add an ability for non-technical users to add the avatar mm -hmm. to the post? Can you have that fetch my my avatars? And my short answer is no. That's not the that's I mean that's, that's not the plugin I'm interested in building. You know, maybe you can find somebody else who wants to write a plugin for for Facebook. Who wants to write a plugin for inserting. You know, just you have to know what you want your plugin to be. I mean, I, there's probably a place for something like add local avatar. There, I'm sure there are people out there that want the want the crazy solution, but I think 80% of users that want to customize their users' avatars that aren't under avatar, that's all they want to do. That's the audience I want to cater for. And frankly, I think it's an easier to manage plugin. People are more satisfied using it. And let somebody else build the you know the crazy plugin. So you 
so you recommend like when a plugin is getting kind of too big, uh, or or maybe you don't recommend building like a child plugin or se several child plugins that basically add on to the functionality of that already kind of bulky plugin to begin with, or would you approach it differently? For a core approach? I think we'll cover it. I mean, I, I think that the goal should be if you if there is some feature if you have a plugin, so let, let's you know let's just stick with the example we've been using. So simple local avatars. If I decided, by golly, people are everyone's using Twitter. I want I want them, people to be able to choose to use their Twitter avatar. Um, the first thing I would think is it's a different. Right, I want to be able to work with my other plugin, but it's a different plugin. It does something different, right? There's somebody out there saying I want to get avatars from Twitter, and that's what the plugin does. Or if you if I wanted to extend my plugin to make it work with the fields I've added, yeah, I would make sure that I have the hooks that I need inside my plugin, and I'd build another plugin and say like if you you know either just one that you download from my plugin page, or I would say, you know, with the description on the repository this requires this other plugin. But yeah, I, what I don't want to do is add all this weight to 80% of the user sites. Right? I want to add all this overhead, all this complexity, and the plugin that most people do, and new admin screens, new options that people don't want. What about the approach where, and I think I'm thinking of Firefox, where for some settings, you got the basic user settings and download buttons and so on, but then you got the about config. So you know, it's modifying an XML file. So that kind of advanced page hidden functionality. Well, I would say the advanced page with the hidden functionality is the hooks. Yeah. Right? I would say that's the hooks. If somebody's really advanced, right, they should be able to go into their themes functions file or they should they should be able to use the hooks. Maybe I'll put documentation on your plugin page for here's how to here's a snippet of code you can copy and paste into your client's functions file to make it do the following. Um, I'm not in favor of like the quote advanced. This pro, you know settings. you got you got your editor user, you got your programmer, and then you got your power user. I'm thinking that's the sort of tier that you know fits between those two. Uh, right, and I think it's important to remember, and I said this the last time I gave this presentation. There's, there's some plugins that are catering to power users. So I can make overgeneralizations here, but I think to make an overgeneralization, when we talk about what would Core do, it's important for us to remember as developers and power users that WordPress, the reason WordPress is so successful is because it is not a tool built for developers and power users. WordPress is a tool built for publishers and writers and users. Right? It's incredibly powerful if, you, if you're smart and you want to get it under the hood. You want to get into the hooks and you want to build your own functionality. There's an amazing amount of things you can do, um, but it's not made for somebody that wants to tweak everything in the world. And it's a it's a slot, it's an it's an easy I think sometimes trite example to use, but let's but let's do it anyways. Let's you know iOS right, right. Like if you're a programmer and you want to build applications for it, you want to be smart enough to do that. You can do some pretty awesome things, but they're not going they're not catering to the class of users in the middle. Right, between like basic users who just want a phone that works and just want to use it and the upper end that wants to be able to program and build things. Right? So WordPress, WordPress's approach is one that says we're gonna build a tool, a simple to use, easy tool for people that want to publish sites. Um, so very I guess I'm not sure if I really directly answered your question. For me, I leave those power users options out. Um, and then for the experts they have they have books. With these slides, the slides are on tenup.com, by the way. I'll add. No, I should have added it to this revision, but that's a very good point. There is a style guide out there. Yeah. Um, these hooks and filters are a little, are a little bit overwhelming to me. Um, I've read uh, like Justin Catalog's uh, WordPress plugin book, and aside from things like that, it seems like the best thing to do is just read code. Is that really the best way to stay? On top of 
I mean, I, it's not the right answer for everybody. It is how I do it, right? Like, I do think at the end of the day, if you want to look for hooks, if you want to look for how things are happening, if you have to plug in and do all sorts of neat things, yeah, I mean, I think the best way to go is right to the source and look at the code. I mean, maybe something I should actually have is like, actually giving me an idea, you know, to add to this presentation. One of the things I probably should have talked about is how you write your code, right? Like, if you, again, if you look at Core and what Core does in terms of how they write their code, they're very disciplined about it. There's the same coding standards you know, occasionally you'll find an exception, but basically there's the same coding standards down to indentation and use of spaces and code throughout core. Every function has PHP doc documentation around what it does, an explanation for every parameter. You know, well commented. There's very there's a WordPress coding standards article that every developer we hire and agree as their first thing, because we also adhere to those specs so we can collaborate as a team, not have to be <coughs> driving each other nuts with tabbing preferences and commenting preferences. Um, so one of the things, again, it's a good thing that I should add to this, one of the things you should be doing when you're writing your plugins is use those coding standards, right? Write code, document your code the way that WordPress does, because it is meant for anybody to be able to come in, look at the source code, figure out how things work, you know, find hooks. Um, so I, it's kind of a roundabout answer, but, you know, again, any, I can tell every developer that I've mentored or that I've brought into the team, the first, I, one of the first ideas I try to convey is, like, the, you will never become a great WordPress developer. You can become a really good one. I don't think you'll ever become a great one if you don't get, if you don't, if you're not comfortable looking at core code, and looking for what you want in core code, and understanding how to read core code. There's nothing like knowing how to modify, like what um, a query post is a crazy example. But there's nothing like knowing how to modify what get avatar does. Like go and look at the get avatar function in core and see what it does. It's not really. I think some people are think like that's like super high end engineer programmer stuff. Like my eyes are gonna fall out if I look at that. It's really not that bad. It's really not that. You know, if you start getting into like the WP HTTP class, you might lose an eyeball. You know, if you start getting into like the permalink rewrites, you know, you might run away. You never want to look at core code again. But most of it's not that bad. It's meant to be understandable. Anything else? Uh, speaking of code, when um, Say how you mean, like how do you use hooks or how to? Yes, well, in my experience is it's written all differently when you put it in the function file, and if you actually write it right on the, on the PHP page that you want to change. I'm not I'm not really sure what you're referring to as the PHP page, but I mean the, the, the word. Yeah, the template. If you want to access something on the page, like, okay. So, I'm trying to think how I answer this question without it being like a, another talk. <laughs> um, so the same coding standards, the same way you would write a plugin, applies to the functions file. The functions, you should, the functions file should be really thought of as like your own little theme-specific plugin, <coughs> right? That runs after all the other plugins. Right, in your, in your child's theme, like same or kind of theme. Yep. Yeah, but I think again, you, you could write you would write things in your functions file just like you could write things in a plugin um, that you write. The same coding standards apply. Um, you're going to be wanting you're going to be wanting to use the hooks inside WordPress. I wish I could give you a better answer. I just don't know how to. Well, you could. So I was recently saw a talk where someone was talking about the business of deciding when you put your code into a plugin, make a plugin, rather than putting it in a functions file, and you're thinking about well, is it is it being specific? You know, is yes. it is it required for this site to run? So, then it should be a plugin. It shouldn't even be in the theme yeah. because you want to run it even to change the things. Fundamentally, there's no, <coughs> there's, with some very outer range exceptions, you don't have to worry about like that uninstall book. There's nothing you can do in your theme's functions file that you can't just do in a plugin. It's like their theme specific plugins is really what goes in functions.php. Um, and in my philosophy, again, when I build a, when I'm making that decision, 
is if it is critical to the theme working, it should be in the functions.php. Right? Like, I don't, nobody should have to, my, my view is they should be able to take this theme and install it anywhere. There shouldn't be some third party dependency that they need to install to make it work. Whereas it's kind of ancillary to what the theme does, like an XML site map, right, or extra SEO fields. That should be separated into a plugin. Does that help? Yeah, it's definitely a gray area. There's no real rule here. It's really sort of a choice. Anything else? I'm curious. I mean, you seem to be a, more of a mindset of like building atomic elements, right? Like one plugin that does one thing. And if it's a related function but not part of that atomic element, new plugin. Uh, and that's, this is kind of like a, an ongoing battle I have with my CTO who um, we did. Which side do you want? I'm, I'm on your side. Perfect world. Right. All of our custom functionality would be wrapped in individual plugins, right? self encompassing. Yeah. Um, but the argument that I have is then we get a ton of traffic and everything that comes overhead. And if you ask him, every plugin that you load is overhead. Um, so I wonder if that's something that you've encountered or something you've ever benchmarked or. Do you have any ammo for me to take back? <laughs> <laughs> um, the slides are wrong. <laughs> um, the, I mean, the time, I mean, it, it, I'm not really sure what he thinks just having other plugins. The fun, it's the functionality inside the plugins that the, that's the weight of it, right? Yes, there's a tiny, less than inconsequential amount of overhead and just loading another plugin. It, it basically adds the name of the script to your database and says load the script. Do we include on it? Um, but it's, it's really a custom module. It's not about, if I was, I would never say this if I was talking to the power users group or the, develop, or the beginners group, but it really is not about the number of plugins, right? It's about how much those plugins do. Yeah. Right? If you have five plugins that have to try to do everything, role scoper, and you know, try to do everything in the world inside them, that's better than having 60 plugins that do little tiny micro you know, things. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure what you can take to him except to prove to him. I mean, you can, there are tools like the WP debug that can show you how fast WordPress is loading if you're just trying to prove with pure raw data. That doesn't matter in terms of speed. Um, I think usually when I think CTO, I'm thinking less, hope I'm not offended in this room, but I'm thinking less um, less about whether something's efficient from a, from a raw speed standpoint as opposed to efficient from a cost standpoint. Like a cost of maintenance? I use all that speed. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's even a benchmark. Yeah, yeah, that's quantifiable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, usually a CTO cares about things being done efficiently, right? Your time, right, is important. Yeah. So if it's, if it's much easier for you to maintain sort of micro sets of code instead of a massive. I found workarounds, you know. I, I do require ones all, all over the place. Um, right. So, <laughs> you know, I make it work. Uh, but my thinking is more just like, being able to package it as a plugin, you know, the few times that we have packaged functionality as a plugin, and being able to add hooks and all that other kind of stuff, it's nice to be able to open source something, you know, that's got a base level of functionality and then we use hooks to tailor it for the yeah. implementation. Um, and then I, I guess it's sort of a, a selfish thing, you know, if the ego wants to be satisfied, I'd love to be able to open source a base level of functionality in that building. So, you know, it would be great to do everything as a plugin and then be able to push it out there. Um, but it just it doesn't work out that way a lot of times because there's always the question of like does it need to be a plugin? That's that's what I'm faced with. Like, does it need to be a plugin because we've already got a ton in there, um, yeah. and we don't want to have the overhead of another one. Yeah, I mean, and part of this something you know you just said kind of resonated with me, which is um, I prefer to do less and do it better, right? Than try to do something, try to do everything and have it be mediocre, right? So I think. One of my probably personal psychological rationales for liking simple plugins is I feel like um, if I want to be harsher on myself, it's easier to control them, right? Like they don't become these monsters that I can't support right. and start being buggy and quirky all over the place. Like I feel like it's going to do what it promises to do and it's going to do it well because it does something very specific. Where you build these monster plugins, and I've, and I've done that before, right? And it just becomes, they become a nightmare to maintain. Like all of a sudden, you're all these fun, all this functionality supporting and eventually you end up just so, so related to that one thing is like 
fragility of a plugin. You, I, my experience has been once you get, you know, once you, uh, on sites that I've worked on, we have five, six, seven plugins, and things start getting wonky, and things start complicating, and you start to do, you know, removing plugins and seeing what's coming. I don't know, is, it, is that getting any better, or what's the, I mean, that, that, that's to me why I would favor less plugins overall than I can get away right. with. Right, <laughs> yeah, so it's a good point because the other reason that I don't, probably another reason I build a lot of my functionality into my theme, like you were saying, and just build it again, is because I don't trust most other plugin developers. Right, only my code is good code. <laughs> so, I think, um, right, so I mean, is it getting better? I mean, I, I'm giving this talk, I think, because I hope people get better, you know, over time with this. Um, I think people are becoming smarter, and I think you're seeing, you're seeing Plugins that are out there long enough that are well reviewed and well respected. I mean, it's, it's always a battle. It's the same battle, like I said, in the, not, in the general software space. But you can count on something that somebody else produces. Um, I mean, it's not really it's not a problem with WordPress's plugin architecture. I don't think, or maybe we can sandbox things better in code. Um, as it is really a developer, you know, problem. Because well, it is so open. Yeah. If you can't do whatever. Nobody's going to stop you from writing sloppy code. Right, exactly. Yeah, I don't think it's You're a matter of. Uh, Sorry, I, I don't think it's a matter of how many plugins you have that install with how many plugin developers you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's the way we're looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Here's yeah. the Unix one, really. I mean, small, you know, each, each program does one simple thing, does it well, and I mean, it's really fair that the Unix lot, you know, from the Yeah. Thanks. I, mean, I do plenty of things that end up having to be complex to you, but I, I like things, I don't know, I like things simple. That makes me simple, but I like things that. You work for a lot. There's so much technology that gets so convoluted, right? And slow and painful to use. I like, I like, yeah, I like things that are simple and do something elegantly. You know, don't have tons of layers of overhead and complexity built in. Simple building blocks. I mean, that was the yeah. idea. Just bring them together. And right. It's part of me. What's what makes again? It's the idea WordPress is built on. Right. They're very staunch. We're not going to build in forms into core. Right. We're not going to. You don't even build spam protection to core as an add on, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's talk of, I mean, I think there's a lot of debate about, you know, there's legacy issues, but there's talk of uh, pulling things out of core, making them more modular, like the uh, like the email article functionality keeps getting talked about as being pulled out of core, which we'll plug in. Or that we like, like, lightweight, maintainable, you know, cores, and, you know, I like the idea of being able to layer on top of it rather than having something that tries to do. Right? I mean, Part of my bias might be that I'm, I am sort of a veteran of like the old CMS days. Like I worked before WordPress and Drupal and these platforms really grew up. I worked with all these enterprise content management systems, like three or four of them. And you know, you walk in and out with the philosophy that one of my cliches is like one size fits all if it's no one well. Right? Like they try to be these monsters that do everything. They end up being crappy and you know, almost everything. Yeah, they check off. They have this big checklist of features on the marketing page, right? But do any of them work particularly well? So, and they still have longer feature lists than like WordPress and a lot of these open platforms. People like this because they can get it. It's easy. And it's not loaded. It does what it says it does well. And it was enough preaching. <laughs> yeah. Do you release any commercial plugins? And if all of your plugins are just on the WordPress uh, on the WordPress site? I have not released a commercial plugin. So, do you, have you supported commercial plugins? Have you, what kind of quantifiable return do you get from releasing an open source plugin? Is this on the record? <laughs> <laughs> There's one person in the room that actually gets that joke. Um, so, I think, um, so I mean, for me, the, the honest reason, so the honest reason I usually build plugins is because, for me, they're usually, they're usually learning exercises. Like, for me, when I built, for simple local avatars, I built because I wanted that functionality and I hated the plugins that did it. I said, oh, by the way, I think a lot of other people could benefit from this too. Why not release it? Um, and then, you know, it's, it's an example of your work to show other people. Um, I think, uh, you know, so that's, and then other ones, like I have, a, I have a page ordering one. Those I genuinely have sometimes done just to sort of like, it, it sounds incredibly geeky, but as sort of like intellectual exercises. I wanted to know, I wanted to understand a little bit better how like Ajax and WordPress worked in that part of the admin and how I could how I could push like the queries to run in the background in Ajax. So I said this would be kind of cool. And by the way, it's something useful and people would benefit from too. Um, 
I mean, I think if you if you go into making a plugin thinking you're going to get, that's not very ambitious, right? That's sort of simple. Um, expecting some sort of, I think, very quantifiable return, I think you're going to be disappointed. That's not why, you know, if you're expecting like you're going to make some huge amount of money or win some huge clients because of it, I don't think that happens. I mean, sometimes like tiny ones that want like an extension of what your plugin does. Um, I mean, there are people that build commercial plugins, and that can be successful. I think it's what's hard with commercial plugins is trust, um, which you know you have to prepare. I think to invest a lot in the marketing of that plugin. Um, there's at least a few successful case studies of people doing it. You know, Gravity Forms. Most people know, and they spend a lot of energy marketing and going to WordCamps and pushing their product and demoing their product and getting it out there. Um, Event Espresso, sort of a younger one, that's been pretty successful. A calendar. You know, plugins. So the model can work, of course. You know, the corollary to that is, you're if you're selling something, it probably is going to be more complex. Um, but forms is not. I'm taking Gravity Forms as an example, right? Like, forms is inevitably not something that there's a. It's inevitably a complex problem to solve. Um, but you know, even Gravity Forms has a whole slate of like add-on plugins for things that are more micro, like PayPal, donations, or e-commerce that add on to it. Well, are you thinking of releasing a commercial plugin? Or? Uh, well, yes, and I'm also thinking of releasing kind of a, a light form as a as a free plugin, and trying to figure out if I should do that, and if if I do do that, how much of the functionality I should build into the light plugin, and and whether that will, what kind of upstream I'll get from releasing the light to the to the paid version. So like the you're trying to upsell them, right? To the basic plugin. Um, I know most people, I can tell you most people I've talked to and that have been successful in the commercial business have not been successful with the free to pay model. I guess it's kind of worked for WP e-commerce, I think that's just because they really, for a while, wasn't another really e-commerce choice. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think, I'm not sure what else to add to the answer. I think in terms of releasing, like, a free plug-in, um, don't, I mean, I wouldn't, don't do it under the idea that if you pour your time to this, it's going to turn you into a huge success, obviously. Um, and uh, as far as commercial plugins go, just know that if you decide to release one, that you, it's not, be prepared to invest before you make much money. Or if you really want it to be a huge hit, which it can be, that A, you have to do something broad enough that there's a large market to solve a very niche need. It's not going to be successful. You have to solve a broad market problem, and you have to be prepared to really invest a lot of money to market it, you know, and building trust. But it can be done very successfully. I, mean, uh, I can tell you, I was told, I think, on the record, I can say, like, this Bank Espresso, they released it, about a year old plug in. They can tell you that they're making between thirty and $40,000 a month in revenue, so selling it, like, an event company plug in. They came out of nowhere. They got some seed funding from, like, uh, they were went to one of these, like, startup incubators where they won the contest, you know, got some money. But it can work, but big market problem, and be prepared to invest a lot. I was just going to add to that. So I released three free plugins uh, on the WordPress repository, and uh, this month the pages on my site that are like you know how to use the, the plugin uh, account for about seventy percent of my web traffic, um, which is really good if you do what I do, which is build websites, because then I've actually had jobs, you know, paid gigs come from those. People have contacted me with questions about the plugins, and it's led into website projects. So. There can be a return on the investment. Have you months. noticed an uptick on other pages besides the content? Besides the um, pages? Through, yeah, clicking through my blog articles. Okay. Um, so traffic from the, the plug-in pages to the, the blog are pretty good. Yeah. yeah, it is actually pretty, you know, it's not going to, it's nothing, I don't think it's anything like if you're running like a huge site, it's not going to be that big, significant, but it can definitely be at least a good traffic generator source, but it's, it's people usually looking for support. Can we to ask you for questions? You can volunteer more of your time. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, when you're doing a streaming plugin, you almost expect the support. So it's like you really have to stay on top of that. And a lot of the plugins out there is what they're known for, sure. is their premium support. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really the, I mean, technically with the GPL is really what you're selling when you're selling a commercial plugin too. You're technically selling support. Well, that's another question. I mean, <laughs> are, what's, I've read a lot of, Differing opinions on whether plugins adapt the GPL license automatically, or whether you can copyright like CSS and JavaScript, but you can't copyright the PHP because that's directly referencing WordPress. Do you have a particular 
Can you point I can tell here? you from a from a if you want to be purist from a legal perspective, it's um, any PHP code you write that runs on top of WordPress. If you want to follow the letter of the you can call it the laws, you're supposed to it's supposed to be GPL. It's based on WordPress, it's an extension of WordPress, which is itself a GPL project. It should be GPL. Yes, if you want to start getting technical and really want to think that there are loopholes, you know, you can yes, you can copyright and protect your images, your media, things that are not really WordPress derivatives. Um, some themes do that as a way of kind of like having a hybrid license and protecting. I would say in general, I think it's it's kind of like it's kind of like the piracy argument in the music industry, right? Like people are gonna if people want to steal it, they're gonna steal it. Right. I, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to copyright it to protect myself from people stealing it. It's more to protect myself from another company trying to build off of my code. Right. And I think the right. So I, I don't. I would be interested to check. I think. I think the theme for us guys is something like a hybrid license. It'd be interesting to ask them if that matters. I think there's a sort of <coughs> decorum for the most part in the industry, which you're right is sort of fragile, that people don't do that. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's a potential problem. But I think the flip side of that argument is you benefited immensely from, you know, being a derivative of WordPress. Right. Unfortunately, we have to cut it off. We're going to take down like five minutes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs>